We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings, this is the anadromist, Burn Power, swimming against the stream, as usual. Today we've got another in our series of lectures and discussions with uh, Dr. Hans Ruckmacher, who was connected with Labrie, both in the Netherlands and in Switzerland. And today we've got one that I've been waiting to get to for a while, but I had to build up to it so that you had uh, a stock of uh, Rookmacher's um, ideas in store, and also that you had a uh, feel for his personality. This would be a tough one if it's your first lecture, but if you're here because you're interested in art and the subject at hand, then Rookmacher will come as a uh, a blast of cold air in your face at a certain point here. Uh, the subject, as you can see from the title... Well, we deal with Christianity, we deal with nudity, and we deal with art. And Christians and nudity has been a, oh, should we say, a thorny subject for quite a while. Um, Christians and art, unfortunately, have, in the last couple of centuries, been a thorny subject as well, although there's no reason for that. But... We're going to listen to Rick Mockery. This is a continuation of the last art lecture that, or art discussion that he gave. And this is a continuation from that. So it's done with questions and with uh, him answering questions. Eventually what happens is uh, he's talking about a very certain um, Rubens painting. And this really works the people up <laughs> and then all hell breaks loose. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Now, one thing that's interesting is if you ever pick up the, uh, this series of lectures, you can read it in the collected works of Rickmacher. It doesn't read the same way that it does when he's talking about it. Uh, some of the more juicy bits have been extracted, but those are my favorite parts. I love it when Rookmacher gets angry because he's passionate. He's not just getting angry. He's questioning certain aspects of a certain kind of Christian mentality that really need to be. And he was absolutely fearless in doing this. Now, this is from 1976. Some of his references will be dated. For instance, uh, Christians since that time have had a lot more uh, in some circles, have had a lot more openness to uh, sex and nudity since then, uh, and not in a healthy way, necessarily. Um, also, there are people who are far more prudish than they even were when I was younger, who exist today, in reaction to these things. And these are both developments he didn't quite foresee. However, his criticisms are directed at exactly the, the as he calls it, the overindulgence in the sex and the uh, see-no-evil aspect. Then there's a break, and he comes back after that and talks about the history of prudishness in, we'll say, since the Renaissance. And he breaks down some very interesting uh, ideas um, kind of dispelling the idea that Christians have always looked at sex in one specific way. They haven't. So, without any further ado, Hans Ruckmacher.
if art has an ethical side, that implies certain limitations. Yes. Now, I, I find this uh, continuing problem among uh, lay people and even some seminary students here, um, specifically, what are limitations and what is freedom? I don't want definitions, but just to share your opinion okay. on this. Um, I'm, I'm, yes. Of the divine depicting God visually. I come to that in a few moments. Right, and depicting man, nudity. And yes, nudity. I will talk about that now. Um, so the, the the other thing, because the second question that is on my sheet here is the second commandment in relationship to art. Um, we we'll talk about that in a moment. But nudity. I think that as a rule, as a kind of little yardstick or a little. Uh, well, a little trick maybe, just to say, is that you should always be careful to judge art by what it wants to say, not what it portrays. You see, is, um, is the portrayal of the breast of a woman a sinful thing? And I would say that's a silly question, because obscenity and um, uh, something which is... Uh, um, wrong in this respect is not defined by uh, square inches of flesh but it's defined by what you want to say so I remember many years ago that I had a long discussion about this and in that discussion this was what what, what I thought why are these Christians always talking about nudity because what is really unhealthy, which is really wrong, which I really think is something that we should fight, is exact all the clothes to women. And I was talking about the front pages of all these magazines around us. You see, they use women as a kind of little attraction point. And of course, these women are all nicely clothed, at least I'm talking now 20 years ago. They were all nicely clothed because you couldn't go further at that moment. But of course, they were all very tempting and oversexed and they were really, well, I would say adulterous persons. So it is not the clothing or the non-clothing, but the intention. Now, there is a great great difference, and that's where the confusion begins, between something that's social and something that's in art. You see? So, um, you can, this, uh, let's say, if you make a painting of a nude woman that has nothing to do with nudity in social reality, it may have some relationship, but the relationship is not a direct one. So, in our society, it has not been, it, it's not, yes, there's a kind of naturalistic fallacy here, let me begin here. Winkelmann, he is the great classicistic uh, theoret theoretical man in the middle of the 18th century, Winkelmann said, why is Greek art so beautiful? Well, because the artists were able to see nude figures around them in daily life. And these people were doing all sports and that's, wor that's why they were so beautiful. Well, I would say that's a naturalistic fallacy because that was never true. You see, and if we think about the classical world, it's not such a fantastic idealized world where everybody was walking around like in a nudist camp and just because of that the artists were so beautiful. No, the artists were the painting and uh, sculpting their idea about man. And art is a metaphor, a symbol. And I think that if you, let's say, I wish that this moment I could conjure up for you and bring it here in this room, Jan van Eyck's Eve one of the most beautiful nudes ever painted and I would say I don't know any more chaste picture in the world although it is more precise than most nudes are in the sense that it includes pubic hair and so on and so on you see so it is very precise and nevertheless it's so pure and anybody who has in front of such a picture has any bad sexual thoughts then I know the source of these bad thoughts are in the man and not in the painting. But there are other pictures where you have probably completely clothed figures, which are very obscene, which are very negative, which are very bad. And I would say you judge on the meaning of things and the communication of that, and not on the base of, let's say, because then it becomes legalistic. And you see, it's used as a metaphor. And in the 17th century, the 16th century, people did not have the prudishness that came later. 
and of course they, they went back to, to, to the Greeks. But why do I use it in my lectures? Because it's, it's, it's easy, it's direct, it's strong to explain the same things that I did last week using some nodes without using the nodes would meant three times as long lectures and probably less clear to have these two bags of women in front of you well just to do the same in, in landscape and then make you clear that that is the same thing it is true I could do it but then I, I, there's so much more needed and uh, certainly it cannot be done by slides yes problem that I have, and I, I want to be corrected where I need to be, is that it sounds like what you're saying is that we should be able to look at a phonic painting of Eve, um, and you say not, to, and it's a chaste painting, yes. and yet Adam was unable to look at his wife even, and she was unable to look at him without shame, because they recognized their own nakedness, so that God no. made clothes for them. And I... And I'm not trying to be yes. you know, well, I'm I think, to be honest and yes, say yes. I'm supposed to be able to look Okay, at okay, 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 okay. I understand what you're saying. Okay. Um, I don't think that shame here got to be taken in the sense of never showing any nudity. Um, let me try to say what I want to say. If it happened to be that in the world around us it was a social custom that we would bath in the nude on the beaches. Then there would be a difference between women and women on the beach. Some women would be very sexy and would go beyond the lines of shame and some women would not. Just as at this moment when women have bathing suits, some of them are very unchaste and very tempting and very oversexed, and some are not. That has nothing to do with clothes. You see, it is just how you use your body. Little story. Very, very sexy woman comes to La Brie. Uh, this happened about 15 years ago. She was a film star, was very sexy. She became a Christian after three weeks. And Dr. Shaver said to me later, I wished I had a photograph three weeks before and three weeks after. Because three weeks later, she was not that anymore. Now, what has happened? Well, what has happened is an attitude to life and to values that had changed. But she had certainly not gone to the, the dress shop and bought a new outfit. I think she was wearing the same dresses, but it is not the dresses or the undressing that makes people chaste or, uh, or think something like that, but it is the way you wear it, the way you move, the way you, you express your, your, your bodilessness, your, your bodiness quality. So I think this is my idea about what happens in the beginning of the Bible, shame. There are two sides to it, as far as I see. Shame is a very deep thing. We stand before the Lord in awe, knowing that we have failed. So, in art, you find two types of nudity. This is the definition of Kenneth Clark, who wrote a book on this. He says you have the, the nudity in the sense of shame, as you find in medieval art, and you find a heroic nude, as you find, for instance, in Michelangelo. So I would say the, the, the least shame of all I find in Michelangelo's David. It's a shameless picture. But when I'm saying that, it's not because he happens to be nude, but it, it is just the attitude. He stands, here I am, I'm not afraid. Look how beautiful I am. While, let's say, the Adam of Jan van Eyck, which is the companion to the Eve, um, if you look at that, then you know this man stands in shame before the Lord. He says, I'm weak. Just like the Bible says, you will stand without clothes before the Lord. Naked you stand before the Lord. That means you doesn't have to cover. It's not in your greatness, but in your weakness. In that sense, I think shame means what it means in the beginning of the Bible. There's a second point to it, and I think it's, re it's related. Um, if God does something in the Bible, it always has a double point to it. I mean this. If God comes with the curse, what does it mean? It means also grace. Let me be precise. If God said, from this moment on, death will be a reality. Nobody's saying, hooray, now we're going to die. Nevertheless, there is one reason to say, hooray, people do die. 
because let us think for one moment that people did not die after the fall. That would mean that we would have all the the, the very horrible tyrants and uh, criminals in all history around us. Happily, these people finished their lives. And everybody says, hooray, you see. I, I'm waiting with Kefa here that Amin will die in Uganda. That will be a day of rejoicing. And happily he dies. It takes too long a time. That's another thing, this case. You see? So, but that's reality that we're talking about. So, there's, there's grace in it. There's also... Um, uh, this, that people are afraid to die. That puts a check on their wickedness. Suppose that a gangster would never be afraid to die. Then the gangster would be really a gangster. But now there's a check on him. He is, has, has the fear of his own death to begin with. You see, so it puts a check on things. Now the same thing. If God had not given shame to man, I think it's a gift, then I think that boundaries wouldn't be there. Now, if men and women approach each other, there's always barriers to overcome. There are some, some little thresholds to go over, or little doors to open. So, a man never jumps on a woman, unless he rapes her, but then we call it rape, and it's something wrong. But if a man comes to a woman, he begins to touch her softly, and she accepts the touch or answers the touch. And so we go on meeting each other, and every time a little barrier has to be overcome, and certainly there are some strong barriers, and that's where we talk about shame. So there's something very different to bath together in a nude, as is done in, in Japan or somewhere else. Uh, and I don't think there's anything wrong in that. And to, let's say, to walk around nude through a house, or to jump, let's see, if I'm the guest in Japan, I've never was, but if I would be, and people would say we're taking a bath, and I would bath with them in the nude, that does not mean that that evening I'm invited to just jump on a woman of that man and in the bed, because there is shame. And these are boundaries. I think that shame is very much tied up with the most intimate parts of man. So, to be very precise, if you look at all these paintings, then you will find that there is a limit. And that means that the real intimate parts of the woman is never shown. You see, a woman can stand without clothes and you don't see the intimate parts. They are hidden. And that's maybe why a woman is an easy portrait in the nude, because you can depict her completely in all her beauty, and she can become a symbol for humanity in its manifold aspects without going to the real tough point, if I may say so. Just like that, in man, you can see many pictures of man, and there's nothing wrong with man, but you will very rarely see, and if you see it, it's always very strong, um, and usually in a wrong sense strong if you see an erection of a man you will never see that because there it becomes very strong and that's the moment of shame you see so it is, it is I think it's a gift of God that put a restraint on sexual relationships so we don't have free love and we no, don't live uh, to say it in a rough way in a fucking world thanks to the Lord because he gave us shame but we shouldn't say shame comes there where you see somebody in the nude that's a little bit too much and I think that's not what it meant. I think that's a 19th century interpretation. It comes out of Victorianism. So we, I think we should have the right barriers and the right forms here. But these things are touchy. And I would say um, there's also our own feelings implied. Um, I think that there should be more freedom, more openness on this point, but it's very difficult. And if parents are not able to deal with their children on this level, then they should be very careful and try to get their children to go further. Maybe in two or three generations we have more openness uh, and, and know better, understand better. Our feelings are thwarted. Of course, we shouldn't be idealistic. Never in history was the man-woman relationship completely right. There's always something wrong. But that uh, being in a perfect world of sinful beings. Yes? We have a concern to live for God to be in so what we have is one of the issues possibly that we're scaring is that of sin. And I wonder, in terms of creative expression, the possibility that art has to be sinful. And I would um, specifically focus on the two paintings that have been mentioned 
I'll begin this morning of the rape of the saving women. And your, um, it seems to me, justification of the meaning of the beauty of the one, the Rubens, uh, had something to do with the fact that these men married the women afterward. But that contradicts God's, God's word. It's still the sin in God's eyes. It's still a lie for us as Christians. There's nothing beautiful about that in any meaning way. Now, it, it could it seem that in the sense of the God is trying to communicate, to bring beauty through a realization of understanding of beauty. But at that very point, uh, though we may say it's beautiful in its execution, in its color, in its composition, it's incredibly ugly because it depicts rape. There is no way that I can oh. look at the Word of God and find that rape is beautiful. Yes, may I go on from here and try to answer your question? I would say why I, in my opinion, Rubens' painting of the rape of the Sabine woman, that's your question about, and I put it on the screen, and I put the side of that, that what I think is a horrible picture, that Corinth, which was showing rape in a very cheap way, um, because Rubens' painting deals with a subject which is very rare in art, it's really totally unique, but we got to understand what he was doing. He was using a classical story. The classical story talks about rape. The interesting thing about it is, and I think these are overtones, uh, associations, uh, allusions that are in that work, that Rubens, knowing these things, used that, that these gods were good gods. There was nothing rough in it. And when it said afterwards he immediately married them, that means that it is not just a rape for rape's sake. It's not just uh, rape in the bad sense, misusing a woman and then just like her uh, putting, uh, let her lying as she is on the road and go away. No. But the story is, if you would say, well, that's a story, and, well, it's not that ugly, but nevertheless it's not perfect, and it's still not according to the laws that God gave for man-woman relationship, I do agree. But I don't think that's the point, because Rubens was searching for a very strong visual image, and he used the story to bring forth, and that was my point, a motive. The motive in which the woman is the inspiration for man. 
and the inspiration, the inspiration, so the real content of that picture is the woman inspires the man to great deeds. And I think then there's nothing against the scripture then, if I say so. And I really think that what is the beauty of that Rubens picture is that it was not talking about sex in the sense that 20th century man talks about sex, but that it talks about, let's say, the erotic in a very full human sense, which is, I think, very beautiful, and that we have little understanding of today just because sex had been brought to, let's say, the two animal level. You know, and that was the animal level that I showed you in one Rembrandt that the 17th century man would also say no to. You see, but it is exactly in a man-woman relationship, in a love relationship, that is exalted by that picture. So don't look too narrow, too, too myopic in a way, to the little story. Because Rubens was just using the story as a metaphor for something great he had to say, and the greatness that he had to say is that the woman, including her bodiliness, that the woman inspires the man for great deeds. But then say, including the bodiliness means not only by being sex, or only by, let's say, sexual impulse. No, by the fullness of her womanhood, she inspires the man in her fullness of his malehood, if that's an English word, uh, to great deeds. And that is what the picture about. And that's why I think it is not only in forms and, and, and little stylistic matters, because it's a fantastic picture on that level, but it's also in its content such a beautiful picture. Then the question is possibly more meaningful in terms of what is the relationship between an artist and sin, or can an artist so depict sin that it's beautiful? No, I would say, and that comes in the question that we had before, the beauty in art is related to the reality that it depicts. And if you tell the lie about reality, it bec and you try to do it beautiful, it becomes really ugly. But that's not consistent with what God has told us to do. Uh, I don't understand what you're saying. I'm saying that if you try to make something which is a lie or ugly, and what sinful is a lie, you see, beautiful, that it becomes really very ugly. Because you cannot try to make the ugly beautiful. You see, you get attention, and it becomes too strong. I guess you already gave you some examples. So, um, if you, I would say, they often come, always come with this question to me. Can I, as an artist, depict the negative? Corruption, murder, all the bad things in the world around us. Can I protest in my art that it's ugly? It's bad. And my answer is yes, you can. But be very careful because the artists around us, the modern artists, depict all these things, but they do it in a different way. And that was a Gnostic I talked about last week, saying the world is bad. But if you paint rape as rape and saying it's rape and therefore bad, you have made a beautiful picture. At least, it's a possibility to make a beautiful picture, because it's a very difficult subject. You see, so, in, in, in literature, or in, in, in theater, or in film, you can have very strong moments which are really talking about something that's very ugly. If it's shown in its ugliness, it's true. A film that I found wanting, just to give an example, is the film that probably many of you have seen, Barbara Streisand's The Way We Were. It begins, left-wing girl, right-wing boy, they meet each other, they fall in love with each other, but it's difficult, they have such different understandings and lifestyles. He is a writer, she becomes his uh, conscience, as it were, and they do marry. Well, people who marry, left-wing, right-wing, that's difficult. And the film shows us the difficulties, and it works, and it's fine, it's fantastic. They go to Hollywood, and he becomes a very famous filmmaker, and so on. Up till that point, the film is fine, and I can be with it. I would say that's beautiful. But at a certain moment, the man compromises, and that can happen. That's wrong, that's bad, that's ugly, he shouldn't have compromised, but he did. That's human. But now the problem, how do we solve it? Well, as a kind of very trite symbol, now I begin to talk negatively, you hear? As a very trite and superficial symbol, in the film, they only found this solution that now the marriage had to be broken and there was divorce. 
So at the very moment that the baby is born, the same day the man leaves. That is the scene where you see the man taking leave of his wife. And I felt that scene and everything that goes on in the film later, because the next mo the next shot is that you see her ten years later, still as a left wing girl walking around with Ben the bomb protest marching and so on, and you see him going into Hilton with a beautiful woman taking a fantastic dinner. That's a right wing attitude to life. Okay, well this this duality, and I would say at the moment of that divorce, the film becomes totally a lie. And I think it's bad propaganda because it makes people think that you can um, go out of each other that easily, that you can have a divorce that easily. Because I know, and out of my own life experience, that it doesn't work. In Labrie, we have these people, and so would know if these people really divorce, the man will never write a book anymore in his life. And the woman will be, let's say, come to Labrie, and we will have a hard, hard time, maybe half a year, just to bring her back to normalcy and make her human again. It doesn't work like this. It's a lie. And it's a lie because it's against reality. And, and I think the wrongness of the film is that it doesn't show that. It makes something in a very sweet, and I would say very sentimental ending, where it could have been strong and real. Yes? No, it doesn't, because it says that divorce is wrong, because the woman is inspiration to the man, he shouldn't break that. That's what the picture is about. It talks about strong married relationships. No, it doesn't suggest rape. It is uses the metaphor of rape for the woman. It's only a metaphor. It's not a story about rape. The other picture was rape. In the bad sense. This is just a metaphor of rape. But it is not true rape. Rubens never said, if you rape a woman, it's beautiful. Rubens would say that that's ugly. But the marriage situation, that's fantastic. Because now the woman becomes inspiration to the man. And if anybody in the world could say that, it's Rubens himself. Because he was twice married and both times very happy. And he, and he has depicted his wives also in the nude. Because they were his inspiration. Also in the bodily sense but in a much deeper sense too. And so you just misunderstand the word rape in the rape of the brothers of the Kippers because it's just a trite little title that brings you into deep realities. He uses it as a, as a metaphor, but we shouldn't uh, lay any stress on rape here because that's not the point. And of course that's not the point in many other 17th century pictures. It's always the, the, the strong relationship of man-woman. Rape in the sense of rape in the, in the low sense, eh, you find in that picture that I showed by Rubens, that etching of the wife of Potiphar. There you have the sheer sex and all its uglinesses. So it makes a difference. I hope you begin to understand. Think about it. No, it just tried to, to, well, it was such a low and bad picture, I think it really tore it down. It did two things, it tore down the Rubens. It looked at the Rubens as, uh, let's say, a very uh, superficial looking Christian American look at that picture and say, well, that's a bad rape. And I think that's not the case. You just tear something down that's beautiful, and I think I hate it for that reason. It's a kind of comment on that painting. And secondly, it makes it so ugly. But it didn't show the uglinesses of the rape, if it had done that, okay? But it, 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 it was just a bad picture. I, I can't see it another way, and I think nobody will see that in another way. I'm sorry. Yes? The problem that I think of is being made about here is that your ability to understand the stories, your analytical approach to art, precludes a certain knowledge of all that's implicit in those pieces no. of art. No, no, sorry. When, when we no. come to any piece of art without that precludes. No, no, sorry, sorry. Of course, I said you see what you know, right? I said... And that's where I began, and where I will end, you see what you know. And of course, your knowledge is implied, but it's not true. This is a wrong uh, conclusion out of a right definition. Um, if you look at the Rubens, and that's the greatness of 17th century art, 
I'm not saying that there's no criticism to be made on Rubens. I can make my criticism, but I think we should begin with giving honor due to where honor is due. And this is one of the greatest artists in the world. And he was a man who had, at least at this point, very deep understanding, and he was able to bring it forward very beautifully. So let's give him honor. And let's not begin with criticism, but end with it very softly in this case. So uh, Rubens and... It's true of all 17th century art, also the Dutch art. This art works in layers. So what you see, if you're walking in a palace and you have such a Rubens hanging on the wall, it's a very beautiful ornament. It's fantastic colors, and that's what it is. You can pass it by like that. And it's beautiful. But now you stand still and you begin to look at it. And what you see first is movement, fantastically painted women and men. That is the next layer. Then you begin to ask the story. And the story has very complex implications. Indeed, if I want to make you really truly understand the meaning of subject matter in 17th century art. I tried to do that in my scheme with motives and themes. You see, it is not a little story. The story is used for a motive. Well, then we, be, we listen to the story and we think a little bit through what the, are the implications and why it's used. And then we go on to the true motive. And then the true motive, we can go deeper and deeper. And in a way, uh, the, it, these paintings have, in the end, you end with a universal that love is so important. You see, and if I see that all, all together, then um, I really begin to say, well, this is one of the greatest works of art, which I think it is, incidentally. Now, I understand that if you come for the first time to Munich and you stand in front of that painting, you are not able to talk like I am doing and if I stand in front of that painting, but that's obvious. I'm a professor in the history of art and you are not. But that does not mean that I see things that you do not see. Because the moment I see things that you do not see, there must be something wrong. And there can be something wrong, and I think, may I just take, make a metaphor here. I gave the lecture I gave you on Thursday night, half a year ago in Calgary. I'm sorry, I got to name names. Uh, I gave the lecture in Calgary. While, when I was giving the lecture, some people went away during the lecture. And the next days, many people came up to me and they said, uh, are these nudes not obscene, and is that not pornography, and so on. And well, I must say, when the first person comes to you, you say, oh, maybe I've overrated my audience, maybe I've made a mistake, uh, maybe I didn't make myself clear. Of course, these people are not accustomed to this type of things. After all, they live in Calgary, somewhere in the backwoods of the world. So, uh, but I must say, as people went on asking me, that after a day, I felt very worried. And I was really worried. So we had a discussion two times, two evenings later, and I sat on my little table, and I said, I'm so worried. What is the worry? Two evenings ago, I was giving a lecture in Park Street Church. It is the same lecture I gave here at Calgary Church. Uh, about God's will, uh, God's salvation, man's calling. When I finished my lecture, somebody said to me, you are an art historian, aren't you? You know something about art. I have a question about it. Well, he had a good question. And we talked about it. Then somebody in the back in the room said, may I have a question? And of course, he could have a question. He said, well, if an artist, if a Christian is an artist and he goes to an art school, well, what about it? He has to paint notes and so on and so on. And I feel that it's totally out of context. And I'm worried. I'm really worried. Deep down inside, I'm worried. What is happening here? Are you not living people? You see, it's something like this. You are going to be uh, to found a new bank. You see? But do you have to have a bank? You've got to have money. You've got to have a building. You've got to have personal... Of course, you've got, and that's a prerequisite to have understanding of banking problems and money problems. Okay, well, if you will go around and say you're worrying all the time where you're going to buy your paper, I'm saying you're a fool. You shouldn't make a, 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 a building, and you shouldn't make a bank, because you're thinking about two little things. Well, that's the relationship. If we talk about art, we don't talk about nudity. It's such a little thing. 
in relationship to the big things. Well, I know nudes and, and humanity. Why is it such a loaded thing? Not because the nude is so loaded, but because humanity is so loaded. Because reality is so loaded. And, and it's good to think about it, but we shouldn't make it too strong. And I'm really worried if in America people always talk about it. I think it's completely out of context. It's a little thing. It's not a big thing. It's so beautiful. And if I look to the Rubens and anybody wants to drag it down and say that it is, well, pornography or anything, I really feel, and that's insight in my body, I really feel to slash that person and say, you don't know what you're talking about. You're debasing the world. You say that something that's beautiful is ugly. You're, you're, you're raping women. That's a rape to rape the beauty of that woman in that painting and to say that she's ugly or that she is a whore or anything like that. You see, that, that debases things. And I'm worried about America. And I'm worried about Christianity. Why are we talking about Is that the small legalism? Is that the sentimentality that we're talking about? It's a good question. Is the sunset sentimental? Yes, if there's not a strong reality behind it where men are men and women are women and where we are together. Also having, uh, having bodies. Otherwise, we are nobodies. And I feel that the questions that I was so worried about in Calgary and the gentleman there down in, in Boston with his question, I'm so worried about these people because I'm afraid that they are nobodies. They don't have bodies. They, 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 they don't live. They are dead people. And one of these days, in my last lecture, I will phrase to you the question of a hippie, a hippie question. And I think it's one of the most forceful questions that we can a answer. And we have to answer it. And we Christians have the answer. And we got to give the answer. No, we got to live the answer. The question is, is there a life before death? Is there a life before death? Well, I think if I hear to these questions, and I'm not blaming anybody, but, 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 I'm getting emotional, yes, because I think it's so important, the things we're talking about. It's so loaded. Yes, if we live, then these things belong to it. And anybody who drags down the Rubens does uh, rapes life itself. And, and I can't see that anywhere else. Now, of course, I understand that gentleman's question there, and he's right. You know, have more seen more than we do, and I would say yes, but maybe you were raised in a wrong framework, and I'm challenging that framework. The legalistic, small fundamentalism to which the artist is not to become modern and jump out in the world and become worldly, but the answer is to get back to scripture because scripture doesn't talk like that. And in scripture you have, let's say, people in the past, very, very, very wrong, deeply wrong, shamefully wrong, said the Song of Songs can never talk about the relationship of men and women. You see, it is a kind of uh, uh, metaphor of Christ and the Church. Well, of course, the Bible is full of this. The relationship of Christ and the Church, of Christ and the Christian community is of the bride and the groom. And as far as that's true, of course, the Song of Songs is also talking about Christ and the church but it's in the first place talks about relationship of men and women and we barely dare to read it on the tables to our children because it's so strong with all the beauties of life but we can't talk about it. God says, where is it in Ezekiel? I found you lying naked in the wilderness. And you were bathing in your blood. You was a newborn baby. And I bathed you and I raised you. And then you got beautiful. And your breasts were like towers. And so on. That's the way God and the Bible speaks about it. And it doesn't take these things away. And, and means like, as if these things are shameful. No. The Bible talks about it. It's so beautiful. And why do we try to, to rape the Bible and take these things out? Of it. Well, I think it's a very vital aspect. And in regard to the Rubens, although I'm no art historian, uh, and I, I view it through the eyes of a woman, uh, whether you look at it as a metaphor to rape, or whether you look at it in the relationship of marriage and, and not with all the man to do great deeds, the thing I see in it is a woman who is not altogether submissive, who does not look happy with the position in which she is placed. And I don't see that a marriage can be exalted with women taking that role. I'm sorry, I can't see your point, because, um, and then I got to say with this gentleman, we got to understand 17th century imagery, 17th century symbols, because 
the expression that she has is one of happiness. It's even contrary to the whole story. That is the kind of tension that there is in the picture. And uh, but I really think it goes too far to to deal with that now at length and in depth. I think that 17th century vision on women was not one that says, well, let's say that the women lip today would take, but it had a high regard for women. And if you look at Rubens, not just at one picture, but all his work, and if you look at what Rembrandt has done, and many other paintings, I would say that the 17th century does show a very high regard for women. Not a sex object, that is 20th century, but really in the fullness of a human being, a side of man. And they did it. I don't see where a high regard for women is shown. Because the woman is the inspiration to the man. What's more? And it's not her body in only body sense, because then we get in this, in this playboy kind of thing. It's not the playgirl that inspires the playboy to be horny, but it is the woman in the fullness of her womanhood that inspires the man to be a real man. And do great deeds in the world, and it can only be done if they live together in a very close relationship. Because the strongest unit in the world is marriage, where both become full man and full woman. And that's what Ruben is talking about. And, 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 and it's so clear in all his other pictures, and it's so clear of, if you read the 17th century, what people were writing about marriage. I think they had a very better, much better view about it than many, uh, people have around us in maybe the Christian circles. So don't try to read, if I understand you well, if I may be a little bit naughty at this moment, don't try to begin to protest uh, in the sense of women lip against the 17th century. I think you're wrong if you do so. It's not true. It's not there. I think that 17th century things were much more healthy, of course, there were many bad men and there were many bad women in the 18th, 17th century, the times were not perfect, I know, but I think the ideals were much better than ours, and much less sentimental, by the way. Yes? 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 Of course, I'm... I, I, and I understand what you're saying, I think. Yes. But in using that word, you do it when people think about it. Now, why couldn't a Christian do the same painting to say, look what you people are really thinking about? Yes. Oh, oh, yes. May I just say, I wish that Christian artists would do it. I'm long... No, not in that way, because that's not that picture. But then it should be another picture, and it should be different. But that's what I'm longing for. And uh, we got always to do two things, that is to show the ugliness as ugly and to build up the beauty as beauty. And if we don't do the two at the same time as it were, we always find wanting, because otherwise beauty becomes sentimental or we become Gnostic in saying the world is bad. But it got to be both. Just like I was saying in another lecture, maybe I've said it already here, or maybe I'm going to say it, I've forgotten at this moment, that there's always a tension that in the acceptance of the world, even of man being sinful, I simply got to accept that we live in a sinful world. And I got to accept that we all die. But at the same time, I'm not accepting it, and I'm a protester, and I say, I don't accept sin. I don't accept corruption. In a way, I don't accept death. Well, where is the Christian's place? Well, exactly, because Christ was standing there. I said, I don't accept. And we follow him. And this is the tension in which we live, because we know, not yet. But yet never, the less, we cannot accept. You see, so this attention of the acceptance and no acceptance. Well, both got to be shown, and probably we got to show it in the tension. Would you say then, sir, that a theme of a painting that wanted to take this should try to juxtaposition two, two of these themes? One to the other showing the yes, I think that if you look in the work of Rubens, 
or a Rembrandt. And I did it in my lecture. I showed you at the Danai where the woman was inspiring Rembrandt, the way he did it. And then I showed you a later picture which I thought was, let's say, less taking into account these ancient themes in a way more direct and more forceful. And then I said, do understand that he was not talking about sex in the bad sense, and I showed you such a picture. And so I tried to just talk like Rembrandt because I think that's the Christian's way of talking it. Otherwise, you lose. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you must be hungry because it's ten past one. You cannot miss to be ten minutes hungry. <laughs> to start where we ended last uh, morning, the question of nudity. I've been thinking about it again and discussing a little bit. The one question is why are people, particularly evangelicals or fundamentalistic people in America, so very uh, tight about this? And somebody gave me a very interesting answer when I discussed that. He said, it is because they have always used that little tag to avoid talking about art. You see, just if somebody begins to talk about art and the very first thing is, oh yes, but then you've got to go to a college and draw nudes and that's no good. So then you can just say and stop it and don't think about it anymore. So you take the smallest little entity to b fight the biggest thing possible. Um, and I think... As interest is growing, and there are so many young Christian artists, which is a very new situation for which I'm very happy, just as an aside, I think it's so important that artists are there. It is not the fulfillment of my prayers and the fulfillment of my dreams, but I think it's very, very important, not just because art is nice, or uh, one of the terms I really hate is you enjoy art and it makes you into a kind of hedonist to be an art historian and I'm not although I love life and I love art and uh, I enjoy it but uh, that's not the point the point is that there will never be a real reformation without the arts because the arts bring it to us we talked about it yesterday a little bit <clears throat> but so it's good to get this kind of question out of the way why do we, do people are so tight about it? And so we shouldn't pin in into that little question to avoid the big questions. Nevertheless, there are questions, I'm not denying that. And I think one point that I don't know about all of you, but Americans at large, or maybe I would say 20th century people at large, are Weaken, and that's an historical understanding. Although history is very much in our age, nevertheless, you sometimes feel that the understanding of history is getting less and less. And we've got to look at these things historically. I remember many years ago I had an audience of nice American girls, where were they coming from, from some university, and I don't know how we got into that question, that's too long ago, I don't remember. But I said, you must understand that you're all sitting here very nicely dressed, that you were very immoral if you happened to be in Bali. Because in Bali, women, of course, walk with their upper part of their body uncovered. But to show your ankles, that's really obscenity, you see. So it is, uh, there's quite a bit of cultural uh, customs and uh, ways of life into this. And we should be very careful to judge it. If people, let's say in Japan, bath in the nude together, that doesn't mean that these are obscene or immoral people. It only means that they have a different approach or a different ways of doing things. Um, and we must look at it. Um, just a little bit of the history of this. In Europe, 
the attitude to nudity has always been, uh, since Christianity came, kind of, uh, um, how do you call that, ambiguous. Sometimes they said yes, sometimes they said no. Uh, and it is just in our own days that I find it very strange indeed. Let's say, if I go with my students on excursion, it's impossible that boys sleep in the same room as girls. And everybody would think it's very strange if uh, that would happen. You don't do that. But at the same time, these same boys and girls read things and look at things that in a previous age, and the previous age is ten years ago, nobody would have accepted to look at, and they would have considered wrong. So I think there's a kind of strange tension in our world that things are acceptable which are not acceptable, and are not acceptable which are acceptable. And that's very strange, and I think this is something very wrong. But let's go into history. Um, in the 16th and 17th century, although there was something of that ambiguity, uh, nevertheless, as a whole, there was the approach to these things than they are today. People were not prudish. It's a very interesting little story that I want to mention. Uh, in the uh, middle of the 17th century, during the time of Cromwell, really, there was uh, an Englishman who was traveling in Holland, and he kept a diary. And he tells us how he went to Delft and uh, well, he tells us about his experiences. Now, one little in between, what he was talking about was not something extraordinary, but was something very normal. That was how things went in those days. So, you went to sleep in an inn. Now, an inn was a hotel. If you came there, you said, do you have a bed for me? And they would say yes. And then they would, of course, you would eat or drink something there, and then they would usher you to the sleeping hall. There were no little rooms. There was one or two big rooms in which there were many beds, just like a very large dormitory. And in those beds there would be sleeping women, men, and couples. And as the sleeping fashion was nothing, they had, didn't have any pyjamas in those days, everybody would undress, which is the most natural thing in the world, if you go to sleep, because that's the way you go to sleep. And nobody thought anything about it, that was the most natural thing. So this Englishman, he describes how he woke up in the morning, and he saw a lovely lady wake up and rise, and he said, and I looked how she dressed, because it's such an interesting thing, this Dutch fashion, it's so different, and it's wonderful. And later on he says how he even didn't dare to kiss the hand of that lady, because, well, because she was, uh, well, because too beautiful and something that you didn't touch. You see, so they, they have, in a way, both things. There were, um, there were some moralistic writers in the uh, 18th century that, um, that wrote something like this, that if you, well you see, in those days the beds were in the living room. You see, in Holland you had those uh, beds which were in the walls, and you had them in many European countries. But the bed was in the living room. So, let's say you have a gathering in the evening, and the daughter of the house says, well, it's time for me to go to bed tomorrow, I have to wake up early, and you gentlemen, you just talk on, and she would go to bed. You see, and that would happen in the room, and so on. One of these moralistic writers says, well, it's better not to uncover your breast and the rest of it in the presence of all these gentlemen. But that was a very soft advice. There was nothing wrong about it. That changed in the middle of the 18th century. And it's very interesting. Um, it, it, it's, it's one of these very difficult passages in history. Um, I forgot the date, but there was a, was a medicine man, a medical doctor in Lausanne, who published a little book, uh, well, let's say somewhere around 1730 or 40, talking about masturbation and that masturbation is causing sicknesses. That's completely out of the air, but everybody believed him. And that began all the things that have been talked about since start from that little book. And you see that very soon things began to change and people considered lust to be something sinful or bad or ugly, something you couldn't do. And 
It's very interesting. In Holland, somebody made a very extensive study of this, a very interesting book. He went into all the details of this. What I'm doing is more or less relating what he's talking about. And he came to, this man is not a Christian. He came to the conclusion that, and he gives almost a precise date, somewhere in the middle of the 18th century, that it changed. And it changed in the humanistic circles. Humanism brought a change. And then this man, not, not being a Christian, makes clear that about 10 to 15 years later the Christians followed, which to me is a tragic moment in history. Why did the humanist have such a negative attitude towards lust and, let's say, the bodiliness? And, well, I can describe it just by making it a little bit visual. Um, think about the Duke of, and just give him a name, the Duke is reading in his library, he is reading the latest thing, the Encyclopedia coming from France. He is very well educated, he reads French. And so he reads Diderot, and he reads his Encyclopedia. And in that Encyclopedia you find, what is man? You just read man, homme. And it says basically this, if you read that article, there is no difference between man and animals and plants and things. There is no difference. We are just like animals. Who said that you're so different? Of course, this was a very violent anti-Christian statement. It was meant to be like this. It was also something which com was completely unproved. Of course, since that time, science has worked very hard to prove it, and today it has proved it, because basically man is an atom, and in long, long stretches of time, and I'm not going to follow all that, a man came as a kind of a mistaken animal. It is just a mistake of evolution that we in all the difficulties we are in, you know. Well, suppose, well, the Duke is reading that book and he says, wonderful what this man is saying. It's great, fantastic, convincing. An hour later, when he is finished reading, his wife, the Countess, comes in. And he has just been reading, there is no difference between man and animals and plants and things. So when the countess comes in, basically, she is a female rabbit. And he is a rabbit. You see, they produce children. Well, that's, there's no difference, you see. But it's a little bit difficult to look at the countess, a very high person and so on, as a kind of rabbit. You see. So, what do you do? Well, in order to accept the, uh, the Diderot and the French Encyclopedia and all that that went with it, you had to to save your humanity. So, in order to save your humanity, you got to push the animality of man, which is certainly we have, um, the animality of man out of the picture. And that's why people began so prudish. Uh, that's my explanation. They were just afraid of it. In the 19th century, we even went so far that little girls had a certain operation to take away a little uh, piece of their body in order that they will never enjoy life because sex was, lust was sinful. You see, so, and I think it went even that far. I'm not talk, telling stories, it even went that far. And it's very strange. And of course, as a Christian, I would just reverse that and I would say, uh, just in the line of the trees that I was talking about yesterday. If God gives us a body, then, of course, it's very easy to explain why I have arms and hands. It's not difficult to explain why I have legs. It's not difficult to explain why I have a head and eyes and ears. Um, you can find for everything a kind of utilitarian possibility. And I would say that explanation is too small, but nevertheless it is an explanation. But there are certain parts of the body that have no explanation. You see, the, the male sexual uh, organs, of course, have a very set purpose uh, for procreation. But exactly the female body, that little part that was taken away, was exactly, is only there for lust. And if God gave that, then we are not going to say it's wrong. You see, and we've got to, to, to understand that if God is giving something, we've got to take it out of his hands and say thank you. And so I think it's really wrong if Christians followed the humanist. And the very interesting thing is that nowadays the humanists in, in, in the majority have turned away and they have violently reacted to that repression of sin, sex to an overindulgence in sex. But that the Christians 
being afraid for the overindulgence, and that's good to be afraid of that, and not to go with it. But nevertheless, don't understand that it's now their time to say what is good. And of course, it's a very difficult thing uh, to have a right balance. But I think these things are very important in our Christian communities. And to think about this, how do you raise your children? What do you teach them? We come to the third point that I want to raise in this respect, and that is that um, even if these things are right that I'm saying, then nevertheless that doesn't mean that we can do everything tomorrow. Not because they're right or wrong, but because there's so much emotion, so much of our whole being involved, particularly in these things, not because they're trite or superficial, just because they're so very deep and important. And that's why they go very deep into our being. And the way we were raised, and the things that have been brought to us from our own background, they go so deep that it's very difficult sometimes to jump out. So if a young artist comes to me and he says, well, I'm on the academy, but I have difficulties in going to the life class, then... Uh, my first reaction would be, why don't you try it? Because you will find out in five minutes that it's nothing what you think about. There's nothing to do with sex. But um, if you have difficulties, you must know that there's Christian freedom. And there's nobody who's going to force you. And just like Paul says, if you cannot eat meat because the meat for you is contaminated, then you don't eat it. Because you cannot go against your conscience. And I would say there's something beautiful, and one of the most interesting passages in the Bible, I find, is somewhere in Hebrew, where, or no, in one of the letters of John, where it, it's written that if your conscience is not against you, we would think, being very legalistic little people, that God knows better, and even if your conscience don't goes against you, God goes against you, because nevertheless it's wrong. But the Bible exactly says this, if your conscience goes against you, God knows better, and so don't be afraid. And, and so, in these points, if somebody comes to me and he says, I really can't do that, it's against my conscience, I would say, never force yourself. Because what we do, we eat and drink, do it into the honor of God. And don't force yourself. Don't eat, just like uh, Paul in Romans, don't eat things that you think are wrong. Even if there's freedom. And these things shouldn't be forced upon somebody else. So we should find a balance here in Christian freedom also not to do things, even if they are maybe wrongly put like that, but in a group like this, I would stress that we should really think these things through, and if we personally cannot do certain things, walk without clothes on the beach, well, then we shouldn't do it, and we shouldn't force ourselves to be with it, because that's phony. And basically... It may be even sinful, but that doesn't mean that everybody who does so is sinful and wrong, because we've got to think these issues through, certainly if we are supposed, as most of you are supposed, to be Christian leaders in the future, because you've got to teach people something. These were just a little few notes on the problem that we had yesterday, just to show you that I've been thinking a little bit about it. Well, there you have it. <laughs> Hans Rippmacher. Uh, uh, I love this because it's like he's just simply, he, you know, these people keep coming at him, needling him. And, you know, maybe you're like them. You look at the painting and go like, no, I'm sorry, that's that's not good. Uh, keep in mind what would happen if you said that to Rookmarker. He would turn around and just, as he says, I feel like I should slash these people at some point who who do not see the beauty in this painting. And we live in a time now where we are overwhelmed with imagery. We are also overwhelmed with nudity uh, through pornography online. We are overwhelmed with uh, connection, and uh, you know our online virtual world is has become quite something. Rookmacher would always say, "Go look for the real thing." What I have shown you of the painting here, you don't see it. It's that simple. You have not seen the painting. You've only seen a digital representation of the painting uh, that I have tried to give you. To understand these things, you really have to, you know, at some point, if you really want to understand art, you have to sit in front of art. And this is the point he made in the last discussion about art, the introduction to art. 
Uh, there's more about art that I will get to in future episodes of uh, Rookmarker Lectures. But I'd like to thank you for coming today. And um, you should subscribe. Hit the uh, like button. Uh, subscribing costs nothing. If you do feel like contributing, uh, feel free to use the PayPal link below and contribute. If you contribute uh, $50 or more in one lump or at least $10 a month, then you will get uh, some audio extras, about 10 hours worth, uh, immediately. Well, this is Byrne from Tbilisi, Georgia, saying thanks for coming. Remember, anadromous means swimming against the stream, and that's what I'm asking you to do. Don't simply accept things as they're handed to you. Swim against the stream as the fish do to try to get home. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.